Hello. There we go. How are we doing? Good. Good. Hold on. It's about to scream at you. Man, it's been a minute. <laughs> Haven't seen you guys in a little while. If you're visiting with us, welcome. This is Underground, so we're really glad to have you. Uh, we've been on a, a uh, you can't really call it a break. We've just had to stop for a minute and get some things in order uh, around our city. And so you are probably well aware we've had some, some difficulties over the last few weeks. And um, um, yeah, that's, that's funny. Um, I want to tell you, though, uh, I want to say a couple of things. If you experienced some struggle, whatever it was, water in your home, roof damage, maybe uh, uh, connected loosely to that, um, I want you to just know that uh, we would love to be able to pray with you. Uh, we'll talk about that at the end, but we've got a prayer ministry here that would love to just be praying for you and, and maybe even being able to help you. I don't want to promise that, but, but we want to be there to support you. And I also want to say to those of you that I know there were many of you that were serving during these last few weeks, and some of you were going into homes and, and ripping out sheetrock and doing everything you could to help get these homes in order. Others of you were serving. This room was taken over in a food distribution center really for the city. And so I know many of you were here in different capacities. And so I just want to say thank you for jumping in with us, for serving with us, and for helping us really extend a hand to our community. You know, that's the whole point of the church. Uh, it's, it's not, we shouldn't be surprised that we took two weeks or three weeks or whatever it ended up being off to serve our community that was devastated by a hurricane. That's what the church does. You and I stepping out to serve. That's what we do. That's what we're called to do. That's the, the goal, the point. That's the motivation behind what we're doing. And so I want to encourage those of you that did that, and I want to encourage you to continue doing that, whatever fashion that looks like. But I also want to say something to you, and I hate to be rough off the bat, but I, I want to say this. If you didn't experience any kind of pain or flooding or, or something from this, and you have done nothing to be a part of a a response, a solution to help those around you in need. I want to encourage you that it's not too late that you might find your place or way to serve. Um, I, I said this last night in a group that I was teaching to, and, and I, I'll say it again because I still believe it. I think it should be a crime. It should be an actual crime. If you were spared from any kind of, of whatever, fill in the blank it was from the hurricane, and yet you went on with life as normal and didn't stop for a minute to extend a hand, whether that was financially or through your service or through your time or whatever that could look like, I think it should be a crime, especially for Christians, because that's what we are here for, right? How do people see Jesus? They see him through us. And we had an opportunity to reach out, and we still do. And so I, just want, I, want to, I hope that's an encouragement and not a, a punch in the gut. But maybe for some it might be, and that's okay too. Uh, but we are the church. We are the hands and feet of Jesus. And uh, if you had devastation, then this is your time to heal. And let us come and serve you and support you and help you. But if you didn't, then man, find a way to get out there and be a part of this because we have a true opportunity for Jesus to shine. We'll talk about that more at the end. I spent a, a couple of weeks during this process going into homes and helping like so many of you to pull out sheetrock. And uh, I remember when I first went out the first day, uh, I mean, I do some handiwork, but I don't do a lot. Let's just be honest. I don't. And so me and a hammer is just not something you see. Uh, in fact, I, by the end of the first week, I had gotten work boots and like got the right pants and the right shirt and I was ready. And I remember I walked out of the house one morning and Sarah was like, hey, you kind of look good as a worker. And I was like, I work every day of my life, but chill out. It's okay. But it was interesting. <laughs> Interesting to see how I stepped in really to new territory, and um, by the end of the two and a half week journey, whatever that we were on as a church staff doing this, um, we got an opportunity. Actually, Keller Williams, if you're familiar with that company, set down sent down 2,000 employees from Austin. They were actually in from all over the world for a gathering in Austin. They canceled their gathering and sent all of those employees down here to serve with us. And so I started this journey picking up a hammer, if you will, to demo a house for the first time, just. 
trying to figure out what that means. And it is a little bit of what you see on HGTV where you just hammer stuff, but it also is some delicacy involved. So it took me some time. By the end of this journey, though, I was basically a foreman leading a group of 30 people from outside of our city who had come down to help. And I was giving them instructions, showing them how to use a hammer. That, that I don't mean that to be offensive. Some of them, they'll have to figure it out, right, just like I did. And it was amazing to see what can happen in a couple weeks, man, when you just put your mind to it and say, I want to do something. And I was thinking about all of this and just kind of thinking about where we're going to go and what we do now here as a ministry. And, um, and it, all of this led me into thinking about the story of Nehemiah. And uh, we're going to dig into that tonight and over just the next two weeks. It's going to be a three-week series. But I was thinking about that, and, and something that I saw there is the same thing that I saw here with what we experienced with the hurricane, and that is that most rebuilding starts at the bottom of a mess. It starts at the bottom of a mess. Here we were in our city. There's a lot of things that have been devastated, and ultimately what was left? A mess. And what we're going to see in a minute in Nehemiah's situation is the same thing. It's got to start somewhere. For us, you and I, we're in the same boat as a city, but maybe you weren't affected by the hurricane, so let me bring a, a different kind of mess to you. It could be a relational mess. Maybe you were dating someone for a long time in a relationship, maybe even thought you were going to marry this person, and then next thing you know, the bottom falls out, and it's a chance to rebuild. It could be a career. Maybe you got out of school, you started working, you thought you were moving down this direction, and all of a sudden something happened either to you or around you, and all of a sudden it's like everything came piling in and you're starting over. You have an opportunity to rebuild. Some of you, it's with your families, how you grew up, what happened around you, what happened within your families. It's a mess, and you have a chance to start over and to rebuild and, to, if you will, to lead the next generation of your family in a new direction. Most rebuilding begins at the bottom of a mess, but it's in the mess that we get a new vision. And so that's where we're going to go tonight. So we titled the series, Let's Rebuild. I want to encourage you and relieve you. We're not going to talk about Harvey every single week, okay? By the way, if your name is Harvey, I'm so sorry for the next like 10 years of your life. It's going to be really rough. But we're not going to talk about, we'll talk a little bit about it tonight off and on, but I, I, don't, I don't want it to be about that. But what's beautiful is we're going to see some really wonderful parallels from what happens in Nehemiah's day to connect with where we are at today, but then overall will connect us to where we're going to go in life, which all of us are moving forward. Let me talk a couple of things about this book. First, you'll notice in your Bible it comes after the book of Ezra, and actually at one point there were two books connected into one. Um, it used to be just one book, and then it was Ezra 1, Ezra 2, which we now call Nehemiah Ezra 2. And then they finally kind of separated it into Nehemiah and Ezra is right before. So for those of you history buffs that like that, now you know where it came from. Now it's written primarily, now there's a little bit of a debate, was it written by Nehemiah, was it written by Ezra? Uh, many people believe it was written by Ezra, and I kind of agree with them, but I don't say that firmly, so don't come after me later on tonight. But I think it was written by Ezra, but many people do think it could have been written by him. Either way, what it's taken from is either firsthand experience or first-hand documentation of what happened in the life of Nehemiah. So if Ezra wrote it, which I think is what happened, if Ezra wrote it, what he was reading from was Nehemiah's journal, if you will. I was going to say diary, but only females understand that. Guys don't, right? Maybe not? Sorry, didn't mean to go there if that was bad. Um, so whatever it is, some form of a, gy a journal, a diary, there you go, new word, a journal or a diary or some combination of the two is really where all this information comes from. So not to mention that if it was written by Ezra, which again, I, I think it was, um, if it was written by Ezra, Ezra was a scribe, and so he would have had access to documents that the average person wouldn't have had. So he could have been able to follow up with the things that he was discovering through Nehemiah's writings and to be able to confirm or deny and to write a very clear and articulate passage. And so Regardless of who it was from, it is a powerful story. Now, Nehemiah in his day, he is serving 
We could call him a slave, but we have to say it loosely because he really was at high status as a slave. Uh, he was very close. He was in very close proximity to the king, King Arxerxes, and he served at his right hand. We'll talk about what he did in a minute. And so he had a close connection to him. He was given um, a lot of access, and he had fairly a high status, but nonetheless, his job could have been eliminated at any point. So it gives us a little bit of perspective. He's kind of like Joseph, found himself sitting at the right hand of the king, but in all honesty, when you look at his paperwork and where he came from, he really didn't deserve to be there. It's the providential hand of God, which we'll come back to in a minute. And then finally, the last thing we need to understand is that uh, just years before, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 70 years before, King Nebuchadnezzar had busted into Jerusalem, had seized the city, taken the people of Israel into captivity, and also burned down the city walls or the gates of Jerusalem. Now this happened about 130, 136 years before the moment we're about to step in in the scripture. But it's very important because those Israelites that were taken into captivity, they were under captivity for roughly 70 years under the hand of King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. So this is really where we pick up. And so let's start Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1. I will warn you, if you've been around long enough, you know we usually just go one verse at a time. I'm going to throw you for a curveball because we're going to go four here and then we're going to jump into chapter 2. So if you're ready for excitement, it's going to happen in a minute. Just relax. If you're visiting, you're like, this place might be boring after all. Um, that's okay. Here we go. Chapter 1, verse 1, the book of Nehemiah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year. By the way, pause. Candace, I'm really sorry that you had to read those verses. I was laughing. And I know I, I should be the pastor and very kind and courteous, but I was laughing so I didn't realize how hard the names were and I'd given them to her. And I'm sure she pulled it out when she got here. Just kidding. Um, but she got up here to read those names, so just, just, you never know. It could be you next week. When you walk in with a Bible, you're always in trouble here. You never know. You could end up on stage. I'm totally kidding, totally kidding. So it happened in the 20th year. This would be roughly November to 7. For those, again, history buffs, this is happening right around the time uh, Daniel. The, the situation in the book of Daniel is, is uh, it's happening, not being written, but happening. This is all kind of taking place around the same time. So in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, that Hannah and I are Hananiah is his full name, one of my brothers came with certain men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. Now, let's pause for a minute and make sure we understand. I just kind of talked about this. What he's referring to is these Israelites that had been in captivity and then now had been released, mostly to the work of what Daniel had done in the book of Daniel. And so as they were released from captivity, they went back to Jerusalem. And so Nehemiah, though he's sitting really in a nice spot, at essentially the right hand of the king serving him, he's in a really nice palace, all right, he's getting really well taken care of, he still is thinking about his people. And so his brother comes to visit or comes through town, and he pulls him aside and he says, hey man, how's it going? Tell me what's happening back home. How many of you are here in Houston, but this is not maybe where you were born or where you grew up in? Anybody? Okay, do you ever just call back home and say, hey, how's it going in wherever you're from, Montgomery, Paris, England? I went really extreme real quick. Wherever you're from, do you ever just call home and say, hey, tell me what's going on? Hey, is that Subway there still? Maybe not Subway, okay. Is that Chick-fil-A there still there on the corner? Like, are they still rocking and rolling? Did it shut? You check in sometimes to see how's it going? What's happening back home? And essentially what Nehemiah wants to know is how are our people now that they've been released from captivity, what's happening back home? Verse 3, and they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard these words, this is Nehemiah now speaking first person. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down, I wept, and I mourned for days as I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Nehemiah was expecting really good news. He just assumed things were better than they were when they were in captivity. That would make sense. And he gets the news 
that actually they're in trouble and shame. And we'll break into why that is trouble and shame in a minute. But he gets bad news. Now, it's interesting, though, if you think about it, we're talking about something that happened a long time ago. Remember, roughly 130 years since they came in, they were taken out, and now it's been a, quite a few years since they've been back. And I think to give us a picture of what Nehemiah is experiencing, right? He's, it seems like he's kind of late to the game. Have you ever gotten news and it's new to you, but it was a little bit late? I remember um, I was at a staff retreat a few years ago. This is funny. Uh, it's funny. And uh, do you remember, remember when we caught bin Laden? That's not funny. When we caught bin Laden, I remember this was, a, it was about 2011. Relax, let me finish the story. I talk fast. Sometimes I get ahead of my own self, all right? 2011, May 2011, we caught bin Laden, okay? So this was four years later, okay? We're sitting at this staff retreat. We're sitting at table at breakfast, and Cliff Young, Dr. Young's son, comes up to our table, and he goes, hey, guys, hey, guys, 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 good news, bin Laden got him. And he walked away. And I'm sitting there going, did I miss something? That was three years ago, bro. Like three years ago. Now, he was just being funny, all right? But you know, some of us, we've had a moment like that. We're like, did you hear what happened? Yeah, the Apple phone came out two years ago, bro. We're on the X now. Like, no, I'm just kidding. The 10, right? I mean, come on, catch up. Some of you are like, I just learned something. X means 10. iPhone 10. You got it? Okay. And the point is, sometimes this happens to us. Now, I think with Nehemiah, I don't necessarily think he's stepping into news that he's necessarily late to, but what I think is happening is more like what you see on an HGTV show, right? You know, some of you guys are like, I don't watch that, I don't watch that, but I totally know who Chip and Joanna Gaines are, right? The reality is this, in any of those shows, what do they do? They map out a picture of what it's going to look like, whether it's a drawing, a sketch, or maybe even some kind of 3D digital image, but they show you what this is going to look like. And I think in Nehemiah's mind, he had the picture that everybody must have gone home. Everything's great. They're probably rebuilding, and, and our economy's getting back together, and families are being reunited. This must be a wonderful moment. And when he gets to the end product, what he realizes is not only did it not get completed the way he envisioned it, but it hasn't even really been started. And this devastates him. It crushes his soul, if you will. That's exaggeration. He, he can't believe that his people were freed from exile and yet are still in a situation where they haven't been able to move forward. Here's the first point I want to lay out with you if you want to just take notes. Rebuilding starts with prayer. It starts with prayer. Verse 4 said, we already read it, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down, wept, and mourned for days as I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Let's talk about this for a minute. Fasting. Biblical fasting, uh, we get a great example in Esther, tells us that fasting is to go without food or water or drink for a, a specific period of time. It could be days, it could be a week, it could be one day, whatever it is. But the point of fasting is that we would take something away that's natural to us. So that a couple things. One, we would dedicate that day or days to seeking the Lord without distraction. The second part is that every time you were to get hungry or thirsty, instead of going to grab something to eat, you would stop and seek the Lord. When it got difficult to not eat or drink that food, you would stop and seek the Lord for strength. It was building discipline, but what it was also doing was giving focus and attention to God. Now, we live in a world that we know it is very easy to get distracted, all right? Some of you are distracted right now. Maybe I said something earlier, and you just can't get your mind off that thought. That also called ADD, but that's okay, all right? But the reality is we live in a culture that we're so easily distracted. We're so easily pulled a bunch of different ways. And what fasting does is helps zero in your focus on what? On the Lord. On the Lord and the Lord alone. You remember when we talked about the 10 plagues and we talked about the, the plague of darkness that came over the city and we kind of made a joke that what would it be like to be in darkness for that long? And the more we thought about it, the more we realized it actually would probably be a beautiful thing because the only thing we would be able to see and encounter would be the Lord. We wouldn't even be able to see each other because it would be that dark. What fasting does is zero a sin. In fact, as I was reading this, 
I started to think about this idea of fasting, and, and I got the idea that probably, and I won't make you raise your hand, but probably a good number of us have never participated in, in any kind of fasting before. Maybe you didn't understand it, maybe you've never thought about it, and, or you've just never had an opportunity. And so as I was preparing uh, for this message, particularly at this time, I thought, how cool would it be if we as a ministry, kind of, especially in the season that we're in right now, dealing with all the things happening around us, how cool would it be if we all banded together and said, that, hey, let's do, let's do a fast as a ministry. Some of you are like, man, I'm never coming back to this place. These guys are crazy. And I started thinking about this, and I said, okay, well, if the Lord makes me forget about it, then we just won't do it. But if he doesn't let this go, then this is probably something we need to do. So unfortunately, he has not let this go. So here's what I want to present to you as an option. Please hear me. You don't leave here and go, if I don't fast, these guys never let me back. That's not the case. But what I want to do is open up a moment for you and I to experience God in a special way. Now, we'll send you some reminders as we go through the week, but here's what I want to invite you to think about. Would you be willing to join us, or maybe to join me, I don't know if the band's going to do it yet or not, but to join me and say, hey, on Wednesday night at 7 p.m. this coming week, 7 p.m., I'm going to take my last drink of coffee or whatever it is, and my last bite of food, and I'm going to go from 7 p.m. Wednesday to 7 p.m. Thursday. That'd be back here at Underground. And I'm going to go just one day, one evening and one day, and I'm going to fast. Now, I'm going to say that you can drink water because some of you may have never done this before, so I don't want you to just fall over and then blame underground because you almost died, okay? Yeah. So you can drink water, but no coffee, no, no energy drinks, no pre-workout, men, okay? None of that stuff, and no food, no drink, just water, and take the day to zero in on the Lord. Now, we can't just do a fast to do a fast. Now, I can create a moment here to help us to step into obedience, but you can't just fast to say, well, I'm, I'm fasting. you got to have a purpose. And so part of the days leading up to this would be you examining your life and figuring out, what is there something that I need to give the Lord some time so that he might be able to speak to me? Maybe it's discovering what you're doing with your career. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe you're thinking about popping the question. You definitely need to do this fast before you do that. Maybe it's navigating through some decisions with school or some decisions in your family or maybe I'm going to get my own place or, or whatever it might be. Maybe it's just praying for the people around you. Maybe it's for yourself as you navigate through the tragedy of the hurricane. But what I want to do is create some safe space for you and I to experience this opportunity together. And so Wednesday night at 7 p.m., uh, we won't make like a big deal about it because scripture is pretty clear. We don't need to brag or boast. We just do this in quiet between us and the Lord. And then we'll come back that next night, not next week, just one night. We'll come back the next night and we'll bring in some food and we'll all like chow down together and break bread and break a lot of bread probably. And it'll be really a great way to kind of come back together and say, hey, what, what, what did the Lord show you in this time? Now, if you think about it, we're doing it overnight and into the day. So you're not even really doing it for a full day. You're doing it for just the amount of time that you're awake. And again, this isn't a mandate, and I can't spend the rest of the time because i got much more to say, but I want to lay this out in front of you, and I want to encourage you to participate in this. And so we'll send out a, a, a little message or whatever and, and help you be reminded of it. And if you want to join us, we'd love to. And then next week, whether you fast or not, there's going to be food, so it's going to be great, and everyone should come back. But the moment here is a chance for us to say, you know what, Lord, let me step into new territory. Or there's something that's been in my, on my mind, on my heart, something I know you've been trying to work on, and I'm going to give you some extra time, Lord, with all my focus to hear from you. Now, does that mean you need to call into work or school or any of that? You can still do all those things. But every time you're hungry, we're going to pray and seek the Lord. Every time you would have eat, you're going to stop and have that 30-minute lunch break. It's not going to be a 30-minute time of prayer with the Lord. And I think it's going to be a really powerful thing. So enough of that. If you want to join us, do that. Second thing is prayer. He says he starts to fast, and then he starts to pray. Now, we understand prayer. Prayer is our communication to God. It's how we speak to him. As we read the Bible is one of the many ways that God speaks to us. I would say the prominent way as we're studying the word of God. God is speaking to us and revealing truth to us. But our prayer is really our communication to God. It's our communication, our line to heaven, if you will. And so prayer is an active part of the believer's life. It's something that God asks us to do and to be a part of, and it's a very very, very important thing, and it leads to this. When we give God our attention, he often gives us a solution. Now, some of you have been trying to answer the same question for a long time, and you ask all your friends, you ask your parents, you ask Dr. Phil, but you can't figure out why you can't get the right answer, and maybe it's because you simply just haven't given God a chance to tell you what he created you to do or what he wants you to do in that situation. 
But it's amazing to see how when we give God a little bit of time, he finds a way to give us a solution to whatever it is we're encountering. And so here is Nehemiah on his knees. What's beautiful about this, by the way, unlike most of us in the world, if we could just be honest, he doesn't just jump out, take the baton, and start leading the orchestra to do whatever he wants to do in his life, to go rebuild the wall and go back to his city. What does he do? He stops before he takes any other steps. He gets down on his knee, and he prays to God. That may be the most powerful thing we see in this text. We live in a culture where it's like, go figure it out, go figure it out, ask everyone you know, and then if none of that works out, throw up a prayer to God, a true Hail Mary, maybe it'll work. When really it should be the opposite. That if God's the one that created you and I from ground up, he knows every detail, every fiber of our being. He created us with a purpose. Why would we not go to him first? And Nehemiah models this for us. It's beautiful. We'll come back to his prayer life in a minute because something marvelous is going to take place. Here's the second thing I want to show you. Rebuilding also starts where we are. Rebuilding starts right where we are. So often we're waiting for that moment or to get to this place or this stage or this thing to happen, and we forget that God's works right. God works right in the moment, right now, right where you are at, if we will let him. Jump to verse 11. Now, I was a cupbearer to the king. This was Nehemiah's job. We talked about him being a slave, kind of having high status. He was a cupbearer. What does a cupbearer do? It's a fascinating job till you get to the end. The first part is he was a wine expert. Any of those in the house? Trick question. Don't raise your hand. He was a wine expert. He knew everything about wine. He would pick out the best wines, and he would set it up for the king. Kings always had wine taste. That was just a big deal. So he had an important role of knowing the wine, taking care of the wine, maybe even making the wine. I'm not sure about that. But he would pick it out, and he would place it in front of the king. But before the king would take a drink, Nehemiah would take the first drink. Some of you are like, that ain't a bad job. Sounds good, all right? The reason he was taking the first drink was to make sure that it wasn't poisoned. Because that was a very common way that you would attack someone in high status. Was if you couldn't get to them physically, maybe with violence, you would do a workaround by maybe contaminating the food with poison. And so the cupbearer, though he would pick out the wine and set all that up for the king, he also was the first one to take the drink. And if he didn't die, then the king knew it was safe for him to drink, right? Some of you are like, I like that. I'll pass. Yeah, pass it on to the next guy. He looks like he wants that. In addition, though, to this, a cupbearer, because he spent so much time next to the king, because kings drink a lot of wine, biblically at least, he would spend a lot of time next to the king, so he had very close access. He had a relationship with the king that the average person wouldn't have, that surely someone of a quote-unquote slave status wouldn't have. This is the position that God placed Nehemiah in, and what God was positioning him for was to do something incredible. Sometimes the rebuilding simply starts right where we are, and our position is often God's potential. Our position is often God's potential, and this is what he, I think, I believe he wants you and I to hear tonight as well. That where you are positioned isn't some delay or some waiting process to see, though some of those things need to happen. But where you are positioned, God can and will do something in and through you if you will allow him. Do you believe that? I mean, if you don't, that's okay. But if you do, embrace that truth and then begin to take the steps to figure out what is it then? What has he placed me here for in this position and this jacked up family that oftentimes I don't even want to acknowledge? Why has he put me here? This career or job that seems to be a dead end or, or the boss is horrible or whatever it might be, could it be possible that God placed you there for something incredible? There's so many situations. Maybe for some of us it was devastation from the hurricane. Why would God do that? I can't answer that for you. But could it be possible that right where we're at, God is saying, I have something that I could use this. Maybe I didn't necessarily do this to you, but we could use this. 
and your position could be my potential to do something in your life. Chapter 2, verse 1. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I told you he liked wine, I took up the wine and I gave it to the king. Look how close he is to the king. This is the king. This is like the president, okay? He is that close. None of you are giving the president wine, okay? Not that I know of, okay? He has access to the, the king or president that none of us have. Here he is, though. His position is, his, is God's potential. Now, I had not been sad in his presence. That was the king. I've never been sad in the king's presence. And the king said to me, why is your face sad, seeing that you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. Okay, now if we just read that, you may not quite catch everything that's happening around this. This is a really important moment. See, first of all, when you were in the king's presence, your job was to make his life better with whatever job it was that you did. Now, Nehemiah had a good job. He gave the king wine and uh, probably made him jolly, okay? But the reality is you didn't walk into the king's presence with any kind of sad or sorrowful or angry or depressed face. You were always smiling. Turn that frown upside down. That must have been the quote on the wall. When you served at the king's mercy, when you were connected to the king, you were to lift him up, not to tear him down. So when he says, I was never sad in front of the king before, he meant that. And when he says, I was in much fear, I was afraid, why was he afraid? Because the king had the kind of power that really even the president doesn't have. He could have said, you know what, take this guy outside and kill him. And no one would have stopped him or stood in his way. And that had been known to happen for simply making the king feel a different emotion. And so here is Nehemiah, his position, God's potential, but oh my goodness, couldn't there be an easier way for this to happen, right? A less dangerous, less life-threatening way? Sometimes that's not how God operates. So here is Nehemiah standing before the king, showing that he's sorrowful. Then look what happens. Rebuilding often takes a leap of faith. Watch this in verse 3. I said to the king... Let the king live forever. That was one of those statements they always said, kind of like, hail the king, honor the king. He said this phrase, why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Now, let's pause. Remember that as we translate these words, especially what I'm studying from the ESV, we're going a word-for-word -word translation, it sounds like he was a little bit disrespectful, like, why wouldn't I be sad? My city's in ruins, right? I don't think he did that. It, I guess it could be possible. But remember, when we're translating these words, some of the emotion gets lost. Things that they said at one point don't sound the same way we would say them now. So let's just assume he went in there delicately and afraid, like it said that he was. And he said, why, why would, I, I, I'm sorry, but I can't help but be sad because my home lies in ruins. Now, we still don't know what's going to happen. He could still be killed on the spot just because the king wasn't happy or didn't want to hear about his personal life, because that is not why he was here. But then watch what happens. Verse 4. Then the king said to me, what are you requesting? Well, he didn't kill him yet. There's a little opening. So I prayed to the God of heaven. Did you catch that? He got down on his knees and he prayed. No. In his heart, quietly, probably not even closing his eyes. We don't know the full accounts. So we don't want to read into this too much. But in that moment, right before he opened his mouth to give the request to a king that normally would never listen to someone like him, he said quietly to himself, Lord, give me the words to say. Here I go. Have you ever done that? ever done that? By the way, that's the kind of relationship we have with God Almighty through Jesus Christ. It's a wonderful thing to come in the most humble of places, to get on our knees and to give God our attention and our focus and to seek his face and to pray to him. 
But God has created a way through Jesus that you and I don't have to be on our knees or close our eyes or, or clasp our hands, though all of that are wonderful signs and moments to have in prayer. But sometimes we just need to talk to God directly, and that's what Nehemiah needed, and that sounds to me like what he did. Can you imagine what would have happened if he had gotten on his knees and started to pray in front of the king? That probably would have ticked him off more than this sad face that he had. Sometimes, if I could just take a caveat here, and I want to be super careful here, because I never, I never want to be the guy that tells you to be less loud about your faith in public. That's not me, and I'm not about that. But I also want to always encourage you to consider the people around you. Sometimes. We never want to, want to question our faith or do something that wouldn't line up with who we are or who we believe, but, or, or what we believe in. But sometimes there's moments when it's okay to not go, I'm about to ask, ask my boss for something really important. Let me stop for a minute in the middle of his office and, and lay face down on the floor and pray to God. All we're doing is distracting from the moment. Now, I want you to be super careful here, okay? Because I'm not saying we should never show who we are as Christians in public. I am not that guy at all. But I have seen some people do some crazy things that don't really make sense and honestly distract more than they do encourage or uplift or show who Jesus is through them. And so you got to seek those moments super carefully. Carefully. Don't let me tell you what to do and what not to do, but let me just lay thoughts out there that get you thinking about it. In this moment, Nehemiah knew better, but he knew more important than anything was that he needed to encounter his God before he stood before this king. And so quietly in his heart, he lifted up that prayer. We don't know what he said. I, I said some words that I think would make sense. We don't know what he said, but whatever it was, he prayed. And then he said to the king, Oh, are you ready for this? This is bravery. If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, send me back home, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. Man, that's a request. You catch that? Not only did he say, let me explain to you why I'm sad, uh, would you let me go home? Would you let me cut my job short that probably didn't really have an end time as it was? Would you release me from my service to you and send me back home? Folks, listen, we, we don't always identify with some of these things in the Bible. We can't fully grasp these situations because they, they don't happen around us right now. But I can tell you that what is happening right now, this was not normal. And there were very few people willing to even take this step. Yet here is Nehemiah, and he says, would you allow me to go back to my city. What happens? Find out next week. I'm just kidding. <laughs> and the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, we're going to come back to that in a minute, how long will you be gone? Oh man, can you imagine he just goes, not out of the woods yet, but let's keep going. How long will you be gone and when will you return? That's an honest, that's a good question, right? If I'm going to let you go, right? Listen, don't show up to your boss tomorrow and be like, the guy at church said that we just need to be bold for our faith, and I feel like God's called me to do something, so I just want to let you know that I'm going to check out for a, a, a short amount of time. I'll let you know when I come back. See you later. Don't do that, right? That's not wise. What does Nehemiah do? He's having this conversation. The king asks him a legitimate question. Okay, if I were to release you, how, where are you going to go? How long are you going to go, and when are you going to return? It's a great question. Matter of fact, while we were serving with people uh, going into the homes, there were a couple guys that every day they would just call into work to their boss, say, hey, I'm out again. I'd love to be able to do this. If you need me to come to work, I'll be there. But if you would allow me one more day to serve these people, can I go? And they would tell their bosses, one more day, I'll check in with you tomorrow. And I was, it was so cool to see how they were working through the strategy, keeping honest with the system, whether their boss is a believer or not, trying to be honorable and respectful to their employer, but also to serve the community and serve the Lord. It was so cool. And Neil Nehemiah gets a question, and guess what? He answered the question. Now, we're reading in the white spaces here, but I'm pretty sure he answered the question because of what's going to happen next. So let's keep going. If it pleases the king, oh, first, sorry, 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 I got excited. When will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. He did it. It was great. And I said, verse 7, and I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given me to the governors of the province beyond the river 
that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah, till I get home. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates and for the fortress of the temple and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked for. The good hand of my God was upon me. Did you hear what happened? Not only did the king say, okay, I'm going to give you some time. Nehemiah said, okay, I'm going to take it one step further. I think he was trying to die. I think he was trying to find a way. And it says, okay, by the way, I'm going to be gone this long. So now, if you don't mind, could you write me some letters? Basically, think of it very modern, very bad translation, but just to help you. Think of it like an easy tag. He was going to be able to pass through different things that he wouldn't be have to stop at and deal with trouble or possibly they wouldn't let him pass. These letters were like coming from the president. I'm here on orders of the president. Well, whatever you want to do, whether I like it or not, go for it. So that's what he was getting in the letters. And then he took it a step further and said, oh, by the way, I'm not an engineer. I don't have any supplies. I've been serving at your right hand for the last however long. Could you maybe order some supplies to send with me as I go back to my home? This is nutso. This is crazy. This is how God works. Isn't it marvelous? Now, I would be careful if it were you going for that second and third thing. Sometimes we just got to take what's given and be okay, all right? But in these moments, isn't it amazing to see how Nehemiah understood, listen, even if I go back, what am I going to do? I don't have any supplies. It's going to take me forever to get back because of all the delays. I need someone to send this, and I need someone to send it now. And the king responded. It's kind of funny. Sometimes, think about this. Nehemiah didn't have an engineering degree. I don't want to cut ahead to the story, but he's going he's to almost feel like he has one when we get done with this thing. No supplies, no money, and yet God supplied everything. And he's going to make it happen. I'll, I will cut to the end in case you don't come back. He's going to do it in a record time when they complete their project. Sometimes, listen guys, sometimes God can do a lot more with a willing hand than someone that's skillfully or educated. Sometimes it's simply the willingness that opens the door for God to be able to do something. There's a lot of educated and skillful people in the world, but they're so caught up in themselves or their own things that they're never available for God to use. There's a lot of people willing in the world that don't have the skill or the education, but they're willing to step out there for the Lord, and the Lord does something incredible. That's how powerful God is. He said, the hand, the hand of God was upon me. He didn't forget well, we pray to God when everything's bad, right? Oh, it's falling apart. Lord, help me. And then everything goes great. They're like, ah, I can't remember the last time I prayed to God. I mean, I don't mean to be that way, but I just, things were good, so I just didn't think about needing him because somehow we have this economy now where we only need God when things are bad. But Nehemiah wasn't that way. Last thing. Rebuilding always takes a team. We jump ahead, verse 17, just quickly. Nehemiah gets home. He assesses the damage. He looks at what's happening in his city. He's got all of his supplies. He's made it there. He gathers together some of the people, some of the key leaders, and this is what he said. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. By the way, the gates, when we talk about the gates, which will come up next week, the gates are really important because the gates are what kept people out. The gates are what gave you a sense of security. It's kind of like at your home, right? None of you sleep with the front door open. I mean, maybe you do, but most likely you don't, right? Because there's something that just you feel unsafe, and you would be right. Don't try that. There's a security. By the way, when we were going, I know because some of, some of you that I've spoken with, when we were going through the homes, clearing them out and tearing all the sheetrock out, when you're done, you can see through the entire house, right, on the bottom. You can see all the way through because there's, there's, no, more, there's no more privacy. There's no more security. And oftentimes we had to rip the doors off of these homes so that sometimes there wasn't even a front door. You imagine how unsafe you would feel in your own home to no longer have that kind of protection for a city in this time when there were people all around that were always trying to come in and take from your people to not have a city wall, a city gate. This was a big deal. And so he goes back, he assesses the damage. 
And he says, you see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Let us build, let us, not let me, let you, let us, because it's a team, it's a we. Let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. Wouldn't it be encouraging to hear the testimony of what he had experienced, how it all came together, how marvelous it was, how crazy that God would maneuver all of these things. What a testimony. By the way, what God does in your life is what we call a testimony. You coming to Christ is a testimony, but throughout your life, God's going to do things in your world. When you share that with people, it's encouraging. It gives people hope. It gives people encouragement. And so here's this moment as he's testifying to what God has done in his life, and they said, here's what they said. You ready? Let us rise up and build so they strengthen their hands for the good work. Man, Nehemiah got back. He got in position just like God asked him to. He made the call. Who's willing to come with me? Look at what God's already done. Let's believe in what he's going to do. And he said, will you come? And they said, yes, let's do it. What marvelous Leadership, And here's what's crazy, and we'll, we'll be done. Let me wrap this up. Here's what's crazy. I'm reading this story, and I'm seeing all of these moments that are taking place. And you know what it reminds me of? Right where we're at today. And some of us in here, we're rebuilding from start because of what happened with this hurricane. Others of us, it was a trickle effect or from our family or someone we're close to. And we're working together to try to navigate this. But it's amazing to see how all throughout this story, we see these things coming to life. Here's what I want to leave you with tonight. And I want to take a little detour just for a moment because I want to leave you with this because I think it's so important. We said first that your positioning is God's potential. That is as real as it comes. God has placed you, whatever it is, however it's gotten there, you were here. Also, though, sometimes things just happen. I'm not telling you, please hear me, quote me accurately, whatever. I'm not saying that the hurricane came because God was ready to just wreak havoc on the people. None of us could even become close to giving any kind of answer to that. So we're not going to do that. That's silly. But I'll tell you this. No matter how it got here, there's an opportunity for us right where we're at to look ahead and figure out where do we go from here. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 4, he talks about this little phrase, and you may have heard it before, that we all have a special treasure inside of us, and that we are all like jars of clay. Has anyone heard this passage before? Are you familiar with this? 2 Corinthians 4, I think it's uh, verse 7. Don't quote me on that. You're going to look it up later. Chapter 7, or chapter 4, verse 7. And he says, you have this treasure and your jars of clay. What's the treasure? The treasure is Jesus. The treasure isn't your money, your status, uh, your relationships, even that great girlfriend that you finally found, you've been waiting for a hundred years. That's not the treasure. Those are added on little things. The treasure that you and I have as believers in Jesus Christ is Jesus and the power of Jesus living inside of us. But then Paul says that you and I are like jars of clay. Do you know what jars of clay are? They are beautiful and fragile. They look way more sturdy than they actually are. Doesn't that sound like you and I? Oh, we put on good faces. Man, we're good at looking strong. And got, like, we all got it together, but the truth is we could break so quick because we're human. And you got to ask the question, why would God first use Paul to give us that illustration, and then we think about it, we know it's true. Why does God make us that way? Why can't he just make us stronger? Why can't we just sustain anything? Nothing phases us, nothing hurts us, nothing breaks us. We're just always able, capable. We're, we're just good. A hurricane can come, no big deal. We're, we're ready. Why can't we just be strong? Paul goes on in that phrase to say, so that the surpassing power of God can be seen. When you and I are the weakest is when God shines the brightest. Here's what's crazy. I'm going to be done after this, I promise. I think when Paul was writing this story, when Paul was writing this text, I think he was thinking of a story about a guy named Gideon. Anybody remember Gideon? Just think about it. If you don't, it's okay. I'm about to tell you what happened. Gideon, 
he led a little army. It was a big army, and then God made it a little army. He led this army to come up um, and to surround the Midianites. And the Midianites were down, if you will, in this valley, and there were thousands of them. There were 300 of him. He was outnumbered, outgunned, out whatever, however you can think about it. And so he's mapping together this plan, and here's what the instructions are. I want you to take your torches, because it was nighttime, and I want you to put them in these jars of clay. And we're going to walk up to the top of this hill. We're going to surround this army. And when you hear the trumpet blow, you're going to break your jar of clay. And all of a sudden, the light's going to shine. We're going to surround the army. We're going to scare the fire out of them. And we're going to defeat them. And that's exactly what they did. Now, here's what's crazy. Did you catch the instruction that he gave them? What did he say? Take your light put it in the jar of clay, and then walk up on the mountain. And when it's time to conquer whatever it is in your life you're going to conquer, or for them this army, we're going to blow that trumpet, and we're going to break that jar of clay. Because as soon as the jar of clay breaks, that's when the light shines the brightest. Do you see this? In your life and mine, God does not shine as bright as when we are strong and everything's together. It's when you and I start to be broken that the light of Jesus that's inside of us begins to shine through. This is the picture of what God wants us to see. This is what's happening all around us, and I believe it's even what's happening right here today. That whether it's a hurricane or your relationship or your family, whatever it was, when you and I start to be broken, it's then that God's life finally begins to shine through. And don't miss this. What did Gideon tell him to do? I want you to go up on that mountain and get in position. And when the time comes, we'll break those jars and that light will shine. Listen, sometimes, sometimes God uses our life circumstances to position us so that then when the breaking happens, the light can shine. We can look at it negatively, and we could be angry that we always got to go through difficulty and struggle and trial, or we could look at it and say, you know what, this must be one of those moments when God's positioning me so that I can be broken, but so that the light of Jesus will shine through me. Can you imagine what it would look like if we started to embrace life that way? We know through the Bible it's not going to be perfect. We understand that. Why are we always fighting against it? Why don't we embrace it? Now listen, I'm not saying everything that happens is God doing it to you. But man, does this give us better perspective to look at life and the struggles differently. And I hope you'll do that. If you're broken right now, I sure hope that as your jar of clay is broken, there's a light shining through it. I hope people see you and go, I can't even understand how you're trying to have joy right now. This is silly. You should be angry. But yet they see the light of Christ shining through